title of our lesson this morning is Jesus, Friend of Sinners. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. As we go through our study this morning, I would just like for you to be asking yourself two questions. Number one, is Jesus your friend? And number two, are you a friend like Jesus? In Matthew chapter 11, we find that it's a dark moment in the ministry of Jesus. John the Baptist has been put in prison, and we read in this text, verse 1. After Jesus finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. Blesses the man who doesn't fall away on account of me. Later on in this passage, Jesus calls John the Baptist the greatest of all the prophets. And yet here, the greatest of all the prophets is sitting in prison, soon to be martyred, and he begins to doubt if Jesus is really the Messiah. Of course, for those of us that doubt, at least we're in good company. Amen, guys? But right here, he sends two of his disciples to go to Jesus. And they go to Jesus and they ask the very simple question. Are you the one who was to come? Are you the Messiah? Are you him in who we poured out our life? Now Jesus could have responded like he did to the Samaritan woman and said, yes, I'm the Messiah. But in this particular occasion, he doesn't. He says, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the death here, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. He says, you go back and tell John about all the lives that are being changed for God. That's the testimony that someone is from God. Amen, church? You know, it's, it's very interesting, even now, as, as we see our church just beginning, and in some ways we haven't really begun with our inaugural service coming uh, simply May 6th. Amen, guys? But it's, it's been amazing just to see people's lives changed. As Ron Harding was standing up here, I thought about the blind can see. Well, you know, Ron, less than a year ago, wasn't even going to church regularly. He came up to Portland, the business up there. He saw the Lord. He saw the fellowship. He says, I've got to repent. He came on back here, and of course, you know the rest. The blind can see. Amen? I think about Sal and Patricia. I mean, here was Sal. I mean, here's Sal opening the service day with that booming voice of his. And yet, you know, sometimes we can come across really awesome. And, and, and when Elaine and I first came on up here, you know, Sal and Patricia being the awesome disciples that they were, they said, you know, our, our walk with the Lord has been hindered. We've been a little bit lame because of financial challenges. And so we got in there and we had a little discipling time. Amen. And, uh, now they're doing awesome, and the lame walk, amen? amen? I think about the lepers being cured. I think about Sean Smith. Sean, a couple of weeks ago, wasn't even sure he would have enough courage to stand up in front of the church and say, listen, I want to come back to the Lord. And you know, lepers back in the olden days, they were very insecure because they were just put out. They were not allowed to be around other people. And now, Sean today is bold as a lion, amen? Amen. I think about our brother James that's going to be baptized today. Actually, James had studied the Bible before in another city. And yet when he came on back down here and saw Casey reading her Bible there at Starbucks, he starts saying, hey, you know, what are you all about? And this time the death heard. Amen? And then, you know, I, I think about the Anakea family. I mean, it is, it's incredible. Three weeks ago, Rob and Brandy stand up here saying, we need to rededicate our lives to the Lord. And then two weeks later, Darian is baptized into Christ 
truly the dead can be raised. Amen? And then the Bible says the last testimony to the work of God, the coming of the Messiah, is that good news will be preached to the poor. Well, if you look around right here, you don't see a lot of folks from Beverly Hills. Amen? I mean, bottom line, you are seeing God move among you. Amen, guys? And if you had any doubts, all you have to look at is the changed life. This was the testimony of Jesus. Now, look on down later in the passage in verse 18. He says, For John the Baptist came neither eating or drinking. They said, He has a demon. The Son of Man, talking about Jesus, came eating and drinking. And they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. You see, John the Baptist most likely was in the scene. I mean, he was very much an aesthetic who his, his food was locust and wild honey. Whereas Jesus, I mean, he, he, he enjoyed a good meal and a, and a glass of wine. And of course, each preacher had a different style, but the people rejected the message of both. And a lot of times people blame the style of the preacher, the style of the service, but the real issue is the message of God, is the word of God, amen? And I find it interesting right here that Matthew in particular records the derogatory remark said about Jesus. He is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, why did he record it in that way? Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew 9, in verse 9, we read these words. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Oh, wow. Matthew was a tax collector. Amen. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Wow, Jesus lays it out right here. You see... Tax collectors in the first century were people that were hated. They were disdained because they were Jewish people that worked for the Roman occupation people and got the Jews' money and gave it to the Romans. So they were hated just about as much as tax collectors today, if you know what I mean. And uh, right here, the Lord reaches out to even Matthew, the tax collector. You see, Jesus, first of all, was a friend to everyone, Amen. tax collectors and sinners. And we find that after he follows Jesus, they hold this celebration party at Matthew's house, and they're all fired up. And, and then someone pulls some of his disciples aside and says, why, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, Jesus overhears the conversation. He says, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Of course, he's being a bit sarcastic right there. So I was saying, oh, you righteous people talking about the Pharisees, you don't really need me. I'm here to preach to sinners, but we all know everybody sins, amen? You know, it, it really is a, a, a real thrill to be able to have uh, Olivia and her husband here. And so I was, as we, as we were going around yesterday, we went down to Manhattan Beach. We lived down there for a few years. I was just kind of thinking about all the old family stories, if you know what I mean. And uh, I, I remember one in particular was... Uh, Many, many years ago, uh, Olivia was uh, playing tennis up in Ojai, about 90 miles from here. And she was out in the morning hot sun, and right in the middle of a serve, she totally faints. Hits the court, splits open the bottom of her chin, just evidently blood running over everywhere. They tried to call me. I, I wasn't available. But they got a hold of Elena. Elena rushes on up there. Of course, Mom was there to help. She goes to the hospital, sees the blood all over Olivia, and Elena faints. <laughs> well, you know, we wanted to get some help for Olivia, you know, because she's the sick one, right? She's, she's the sick one. So we go to this doctor who's an MD, but he also specializes in holistic medicine and uh, also some acupuncture. I mean, the whole range, you know, if one thing doesn't help you, the other thing will kind of a thing. And we're all sitting there at the doctor's first appointment. I'd been there a few other times, and, and Elena was sitting here, I was here, and Olivia's over here. 
And he's asking Olivia, he says, well, how do you feel? And she says, well, I feel okay. And then he goes, he does this to every first-time visitor. He says, okay, stick out your tongue. So she sticks out her tongue. He goes, oh, that's terrible. What have you been eating and drinking? She goes, well, just, just normal stuff. Have you been drinking diet drinks? Well, yeah, I, I drink some. And you know me, I was trying to, you know, I, I see my, there's a little tense moment right there. And so I just randomly made the point. I says, well, my wife Elena drinks a lot more Diet Coke than Olivia. And all of a sudden the doctor turns on over. And this is the truth right here. This is the truth. He knew that I was a minister and Elena was a minister's wife. He says, you drink Diet Coke? Diet Coke is from Satan. You are a terrible example for your daughter. I cannot believe it. It's carcinogenic. I mean, it's terrible. It's off. I mean, he just goes off. And I go, oh, no, how can I help Elena now? And so I go, well, uh, uh, Dr. Dorio, um, you know, I have a vice, too. Um, I, I drink a, a cup or two of coffee every day. He goes, well, that's really good for you. You should keep on doing that. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, you recognize that you're sick and you need help, like a Jesse. But other times, you think you're healthy. You think you're doing great. You think you're, you're righteous, like Judy. But when you look in the word of God and you see that the call of Jesus is to follow him, to deny yourself daily, give up everything you have to be sold out. And if you're not doing that, you actually are sick and you need help. Now, I don't know about you. I was, I was really moved by, by Judy's restoration right there. What a powerful testimony to a woman that has the guts to really look at her life and say, you know something? I need help to get back with God because that's what life is all about. And see, the amazing thing about Jesus, he's, he's a friend to everyone. He's a friend to the tax collectors and the sinners, but he's also a friend even to the Pharisees who don't think they're sick who don't realize that drinking Diet Coke is not good for them. And they, too, can come back to the Lord. Let's look at another tax collector. Let's go to Luke chapter 19. In Luke 19, we find an interesting passage. In verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Oh, wow. If they hated the tax collectors, imagine their thoughts about a chief tax collector. Verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not. He was a little bit height challenged right there. So he ran ahead and, and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, so Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus! Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. You know, one of the things that I think I try to do when I, when I read different texts, and it's an account that actually happens, I, is I try to put it in my mind kind of in video. You know what I'm talking about? I said, what, what would this thing look like if it was a mini movie? Well, I kind of picture Jesus coming into Jericho, and the word is out. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And the people are lined up the road. And this, this older guy, kind of balding, kind of a, a Danny DeVito-type looking guy, goes, dang, I want to I wanna see the Lord. You know, it's Jesus. He's coming, and everybody is so much taller than him. Some of you can relate to that a little bit. And so he's trying to see, he's trying to see Jesus. He goes, I've got an idea. I'm going to climb a tree. Now, remember, he's a chief tax collector, so he's not a young guy. 
And if he's a little bit, you know, you've been around a little while, you know how our older guys are a little bit. You know what I mean? And so he kind of probably waddles up the tree and just kind of lodges himself on up there. You know what I'm talking about? Just, just, just so he can see the Lord. And here comes the Lord walking by, saying hi to everybody. And, and all of a sudden he stops. And he looks up, here's this chief tax collector in his nice suit and everything. Up there in the tree, he goes, Zacchaeus. Yes, Lord? He says, come down here immediately. I want to go over to your house today. You know, that gives you open invitation to invite yourself over to anybody's house. Amen? <laughs> if you're going to be a friend like Jesus. Well, of course, the whole town goes crazy. <gasps> Can't believe it. Jesus is going over to the house of the chief tax collector. Doesn't he know what wicked life he lives? Well, you know, this guy had an incredible, incredible heart. After Jesus spoke to him and spent time with him, Zacchaeus says, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. I mean, it was just a, it was an automatic response. He goes, Oh, gee, I got to. Okay, I guess I got to pay some money. No, it wasn't that attitude. He goes, Man, I just want to give everything I have to God and to show my repentance. You know, we had a, a young man studying the Bible up in Portland. I'll never forget his, his name. He is one of the most positive people I'd ever met. And this was before he became a Christian. Yeah. And he was so positive. I mean, he'd make up these words that you go, what, what was that about? Like, he came, he came to the first service. His name's Anthony Bonser. He came to his first service there in Portland. And instead of just saying, it's incredible, he says, this is incredibility. I go, hey, Amen. So we kind of nicknamed him Mr. Incredibility after that. <laughs> well, then he went, started to go through the study series. And, you know, for, for those that are visiting, uh, you know, in order to become a disciple, we take people through a study series so they really know what they're doing when they make their decision. Right. Well, early on in the study series is this study called Discipleship that talks about making Jesus the Lord of your life. Now, there's absolutely nothing in the discipleship study about money. But at the very end, Anthony's talking to the two brothers. He says, now hold it. He says, I, I know, you're, you know if you're going to be a Christian, you, you, you need to give some money. Um, who do I give my tithe to? And Michael Williamson, one of our good brothers, was, was there. He says, well, I, I guess you could give it to me. He immediately takes out his wallet, whoops out the dollar bills, and gives Michael $70. He says, listen, I want to show my repentance you know, the book of Malachi talks about if you're going to come back to God, then you can no longer rob God of your tithes and your offerings. You know, Friday night, we had an incredible congregational devotional. Amen, church? I mean, it was a lot of fun. And at that particular time, we made out our pledges to God about giving to the church. And, you know, for a lot of people, talking about giving money is uncomfortable, but we really believe we're family. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and if you're family, you got to talk about money. At least that's what the wife thinks, right, guys? And, and it was great. I really want to commend the congregation for just the incredible spirit of sacrifice that you had, not only at the moment, but in really the sacrificial giving that you've got. Because I really believe it's going to be this kind of sacrifice that's going to allow us to put on young interns that are going to allow them to grow up and be women's ministry leaders and evangelists that we can send off to other places. You know, right now... Uh, I'm very excited about starting the church here. Amen, church? But literally in a year, we have a plan to start a new congregation in Manhattan with DJ and Casey Commisford. And uh, this, is, this is kind of the final stage of their training, so to speak. And uh, I'm excited about what God is going to do because I really believe that we're going to be able to multiply churches of sold-out disciples, not only throughout the United States, but all around the world. Amen, guys? But it's going to take a heart like Zacchaeus. It's going to take a heart like Mr. Incredibility. It says, listen, whatever it takes, I am all about serving the Lord. Amen? So we find out, first of all, that Jesus is a friend to everyone. Secondly, Jesus is a friend in every way. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Many of our pastors today are coming out of the book of Luke. Luke 7. In verse 11, this is, whew, this is a powerful passage. 
Soon afterward, Jesus went to a call called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry! Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Can you imagine the setting right here, guys? The Lord walks into this little town called Nain, and there is this huge crowd. As they approach the town gate, there's this funeral procession. Now, if you've ever been to a, a Jewish funeral, I mean, it, it is one of the most emotional things. People just are very open about their hurt and their emotion and their sadness. And most likely, it was that kind of a situation that happens upon it. Yet, the, the sadness that Jesus focuses on is, is the woman who seemingly has lost everything. The Bible says that this funeral procession was for her only son, and she was a widow. She had no one. And particularly back in that day and time, not to have a son and not to have a husband was a very challenging situation. So not only are all the people crying around her, but she's crying. Her only son is gone. And the Bible simply reads, and look at the kind of friend he is. It says, his heart went out to her. Now you got Tons of people crying. Tons of people hurting over the situation. But no one has anything to say to this woman. Her dreams are gone. She's in pain. She's probably entering depression. She's heartbroken. And the Lord simply goes on up to her. He doesn't know her. And he simply goes, don't cry. And the Bible says, he touches the coffin. He says, young man, I said, get up. And the Bible says, the dead guy sat up. <laughs> Whoa, that'll do it to you right there. Amen. <laughs> and then he gave him back to his mom. So probably it was a younger child. It's hard to give a 22-year-old back to the mom. You know what I'm talking about? And the Bible says they were all filled with awe and praise God. I think that many of us this week were taken aback by the horrific events at Virginia Tech. 32 students were shot by a young man named Su Heng Cho, who himself then committed suicide. Many of the articles, at least on the internet, that I've been able to read talk about that this guy was lonely. He was hurting. He was angry. People were afraid of him. People purposely stayed away from him. What would Jesus have done? What would someone who would live exactly like Jesus have done? Let's face it, guys, when we become heartbroken, when our dreams are lost, and we go in depression, and we become angry or bitter, we are scary people. And there is a darkness that can make people kind of afraid of us. And there's this kind of a, in America particularly, there's kind of this false idea, oh, I, I, don't, I don't want to invade your, your, your personal space. Which really is, I, I don't want to get my hands dirty with all your problems. No one loved this young man. Now, ultimately, everybody makes their own decision. And who's to say what is the decision be? But, you know, I just have a hunch. Even if he fought it off at first, if someone was persistent like Jesus and fought through this guy's loneliness, fought through this guy's hurt, fought through this guy's brokenheartedness and broke through and 
got this guy to start talking. It could have made a difference. In the apology statement by his family, it just registers now that this heartbrokenness has expanded. The apology included this statement. We are living a nightmare. We are humbled by this darkness. We feel hopeless, helpless, and lost. My question is now, who's reaching out to that family? Who cares enough to push through that wall that so many people put up when they're hurting and say, listen, there's an answer for your life. Think about all the hurting parents and family members of the 32 other kids. The people are hurting. You know, we get so baked out by the glamour and the glitz here in L.A. And we don't really know what's going on inside the home. We should. A lot of us come from that background that was pretty dark. That was pretty hurtful. We just fail to remember, thank God, someone acted like Jesus and reached out to us in our darkness. Many of us rejecting the first few tries. And then finally we opened up and our hearts opened up to the Lord. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Sin can take us to a very dark place. But sin also can humble us. In Luke 7, verse 36. Thank you. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, this is pretty cool. First of all, Jesus literally was a friend to everybody. Gets an invitation from the Pharisee. Say, oh, I'll go to your house. That would be cool. And back in those days, you know how they ate? They ate lying down. For a lot of us, that's kind of a fantasy, you know? Be breakfast in bed all the time. Verse 37. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Let's just stop right there. Here's this woman. She hears that Jesus is eating at the Pharisee's house, and, and most likely it was a big party, because otherwise she could have just slipped in fairly unnoticed. And evidently Jesus' couch was laying pretty close to Simon the Pharisee's couch. And she just comes, and she, she had this alabaster jar of perfume in her hands, and she just comes there just totally in awe of being around a holy and sinless man, perhaps for the first time in her life. Somebody that no longer looked upon her as a sex object. And she's just moved, moved by his purity, moved by his presence, and humbled by her sin. And, and so she begins to cry. The tears come out of her eyes, her cheeks, and then they fall, without meaning to, on his feet. And I think it was just a reaction. She sees that her tears have fallen on his feet. She just bends down and immediately begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And then in homage, she begins to kiss his feet, a tradition of that day. And then she pours the perfume on. Now Simon's over there on the other couch, looking at the whole deal. And he goes, if this guy were really a prophet... He'd know what kind of woman this is. And I love this next. I love this. Verse 40. Jesus answered him, Simon, I've got something to tell you. You know, I love the way that Jesus kind of is low-key as he goes into something, you know. Uh, tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well... I suppose the one that had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. It's very interesting right here. A denarius is worth about a day's wage. So if you make $100 a day, easy multiple numbers right here, uh, one guy is owed $5,000 and the other guy is owed $50,000. And if a person wants to forgive one person a $5,000 debt and one person of a $50,000 debt, 
humans being humans, which person's going to appreciate them the most? The one that got the 50K debt canceled. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. Amen. So he's going, oh, I'm really fired up. <laughs> and so Jesus then, he says, uh, hey, Simon, which one of them do you think loved them more? Well, well, the one that had the bigger debt canceled. He says, you judged correctly. Verse 44. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came in your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who's been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus points out a, a very simple truth. He says, after he told the parable, which Simon answers, yeah, the guy with the greater debt would love him more. He says, Simon, you see this woman? He says, I came in your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet. She washed my feet with her tears and hair. You didn't give me a kiss. This woman has kissed my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she put perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who's been forgiven little loves little. What's the point? It's very important to catch. This woman was humbled by her many sins. She was broken by them. And she was broken before the Lord, and therefore she loved much. She was motivated to give everything. But Simon the Pharisee, thinking that he didn't have that many sins, certainly not as bad as this sinful woman, he wasn't forgiven much, therefore he didn't love much. Now, biblically speaking, the Bible teaches that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Can I hear an amen on that? Sure. And we all know how many sins all of us have done. See, the truth is, we like to compare ourselves to other people, and we can always find someone who, in our mind, is a little worse than us, has a few more sins. And yet, that's really not the point. We need to look at ourselves and say, wow, I see the magnitude of my sin, and I'm just so thankful that Jesus died for me. You know, it's been really quite something coming on back to Los Angeles and then shortly after that uh, celebrating uh, my 35th spiritual birthday. And I shared about that a couple of weeks ago. I was baptized when I was 17 years old at the University of Florida. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's really something. I look out in the crowd and many of you guys aren't even 35 years old yet. But it's been really kind of cool because in the fellowship, a lot of people say, how, how did you do it? And, you know, I wish I could, I could tell people I have cranked all 35 years. Wow. I mean, every day I've lived sold out. I mean, I've shared my faith every day, read my Bible. I've just been cranking every day because I appreciate the Lord and what he's forgiven me so much of. I, I, I couldn't say that. That'd be a lie. But you know something? The thing that has returned me to really where I need to be is a sense of, wow, Yes, I was forgiven of so many sins before I was a Christian. But even after I came to a knowledge of the truth, I was even forgiven of tons of sins. And you know, in some ways, for those of us that are disciples, that's the amazing part. And you know, he who loves much realizes just how much he's been forgiven. But if you think you're such a good Christian then you really won't have the motivation to make it to 25 years, 35 years, and then into glory. Amen, guys? You see, Jesus is our friend all the way to the end. Let's go to Luke chapter 22.
in chapter 22, we find that it's the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, he lays it out with the apostles. Hey, all of you guys are going to desert me. And of course, they all deny it. But the Lord particularly singles out Simon in verse 31. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Wow, Jesus knew he was going to blow it. And yet Jesus still believed in him. Wow, now that's a friend, isn't it? Yeah. Have, have you had someone still believe in you when you've blown it? Yeah. Well, look what happens to Jesus, verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you'll not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from the prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray. So that you'll not fall into temptation. Wow. Here we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is wrestling with whether or not he's going to go to the cross. It's such an intense spiritual wrestling that the Bible said he is literally sweating drops of blood. And you know, when you go through really tough times, it's great to have your best friends around you, is it not? But you know, right here... Jesus was all alone. Only from a human point of view. Because God sent an angel to help him. You know, God's got his angels. I mean, we are in the city of angels church. Amen, guys? Yeah. Got to recognize those angels. <laughs> and he'll give you the strength when you can't and seemingly can't go any further. You know, right here, he goes back. He's not bitter towards the guys that deserted him. He later goes, hey, it's time to go. He's arrested. He goes literally through all the torture. And then he's crucified. Let's look at this picture, chapter 23. He's crucified. And remember that Jesus is crucified with two other guys. One on his right and one on his left. And the Bible says in verse 39... One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man's done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, to show you what it really means to love God, here is Jesus on the cross in agony and in pain. One criminal turns to him and begins to persecute him on the cross to mock him. Is that intense? Yeah. And this other guy sort of comes to Jesus' defense, but even at this point where many of us just be focused in all of our pain, all of the injustices done to us, Jesus reaches out to the one criminal and says, Hey, because of your heart, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, what's your excuse for not being evangelistic? <laughs> Even to the end, Jesus cared more about other people than himself. That's what a true friend is all about. Are you with me right here? See, so many of us think, well, I don't have the time. I'm not courageous. I'm not outgoing. I have this schedule. I have that schedule. Let me tell you something. It's nothing compared to the cross that Jesus was on. See, people who aren't evangelistic aren't focused on God. They're focused on themselves. As Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I have come to seek and save the lost. Now, of course, this passage is kind of an interesting passage. It's been twisted by a lot of different denominations. And people will say, well, well hey, well, right here, Jesus says the, the thief on the cross is going to be with him that day in paradise, and, and he didn't get baptized. Okay, let's turn to Romans chapter 6 right here, guys. In 
in Romans 6, Paul talks about baptism. And he says in verse 2, he's talking to all the Christians there at Rome. We died to sin, how can we live it any longer? Oh, don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised to the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. See, right here, Paul teaches that baptism is sharing by faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that Jesus technically lived under the old covenant. In other words, Jesus never went to church. He went to synagogue. Old covenant, right? But now under the new covenant, after Jesus has died and been buried and resurrected, there's a way to come into his kingdom. And that's by having faith, that's by repenting, and that's by being baptized. When Jesus walked the earth, because he was going to die for the sins of everybody, he had the power to forgive sins. Amen? But now to forgive sins, the Bible teaches, we've got to share in Christ's death and his burial. So the old life is gone. Amen? And the new life comes. I mean, it's going to be wa great watching Shay and James today. Amen, guys? The old James, the old Shay, they're going to go under the water. By faith, they contact the blood of Christ. All their sins are forgiven. And they come out of that water. They're resurrected to a new life. And they receive God's spirit. Now that is a miracle. Are you with me right here? You see, it's exciting to be evangelistic because you're all about Helping people know God. Amen? Let's close out in Matthew chapter 28. Is Jesus a friend to you? And are you a friend like Jesus? Right here, Jesus has resurrected. And very interestingly, in verse 10 of chapter 28, he tells the women that first saw him resurrected, tell the brothers, tell the apostles, meet me back in Galilee. Now, we have to think this through. Galilee is 70 miles from Jerusalem. Well, let's read verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, it's very interesting. Jesus says, I don't want to meet you in Jerusalem. I want to meet you guys back in Galilee on a mountain. Now, a few weeks ago, the whole congregation, we went out to Mount Hollywood. And, and it, it was pretty incredible, wasn't it, just to go up on Mount Hollywood and just to see the Hollywood from the view there, the, the view of Hollywood and then you see Santa Monica in the distance. You see Long Beach in the distance. You see Pasadena. You oversee the San Fernando Valley. I mean, you just go, wow, you can see everything. Well, it must have been a similar mountain overlooking Galilee where they could see all of Galilee. Now, why would Jesus want them to see all of Galilee? Well, what happened in Galilee? Well, he met them there. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. He baptized them there. That's where they baptized other people. What he wanted to do is he wanted to take them back and to see the different places in front of them and to remember the memories that took place at each point that they saw. You know, I was in a study earlier this week and I was working with one of the brothers that's trying to be restored. And we were talking about, you know, having a heart, according to Revelation chapter 2, like your first love. And we, we weren't getting too far. We were getting a little distance, but we have a little challenge right there. And I said, okay, bro, tell me about when you were baptized. And he kind of leans back, and he gets this smile. And so it's like this peace settles upon him, you know. He goes, well, it was awesome. It was great. I was feeling happy, and I was just, I was just so much at peace. I said, you know, when you come back to your first love, that's exactly how you're going to feel. You see, guys, Jesus was calling the disciples to be restored. 
They'd lost their first love. Now, he always believed in them, like Peter. Peter, after you fall away, come back and help the other guys. And then Jesus gives the charge. He says, therefore, because you've remembered what your decision was all about, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize in the name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. You know, it's amazing how much God loves us. What a friend we have in Jesus that he died for us. If you think about it, think about that calling as your calling. You've got to be a friend just like Jesus. Someone who's willing to reach out to the tax collector, to the sinner, to a hurting young man at Virginia Tech, to the widow of Nain, to anybody that's hurting, even a criminal dying on a cross for his sin. You know, when we became a church that's focused on God, then we'll be a church that's focused on his mission to seek and save the lost. And the city of angels will become the city of saints. And a great light will be sent to all nations. Thanks and God bless.